Dear, dear Minister uh, Wallström, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, dear faculty and students, and uh, dear guests, it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to the Hertie School this afternoon for a keynote speech and discussion with Margaret Wallström. She's Sweden's Minister for Foreign Affairs, and she will speak on European cooperation in the context of global challenges. Her visit to Berlin uh, is part of an official state visit by the Swedish government. The king and the queen of Sweden are here or were in Berlin yesterday, to the day they're in Hamburg, and I think they're returning uh, tonight. And, as, and they're here at the invitation of President Gauck. And in addition to Minister Wallström, there are various other ministers from the Swedish government in town at the moment. Uh, visiting with the German counterpart, and we just learned that you uh, had a meeting with Walter Steinmeier just before uh, coming here. And the state visit of the Swedish delegation aims to further strengthen the ties and the really good cooperation between Sweden and Germany. And the main topics of the visit are innovation, sustainability, and openness. I think these are three words that almost seem uh, unusual in today's global environment where um, we rarely hear such uh, nice terms as innovation, sustainability, and, and openness. Uh, we are hosting, and we're very happy and glad to host the event uh, in cooperation with the Swedish Embassy. And it also takes place in the framework of a conference on global energy and climate policies, namely the Energy and Policy Exchange Forum. And it's a topic that actually relates back to work you did uh, in, the, I think, the 1990s and then later on where you, uh, at the European Commission, worked on uh, environmental uh, issues. Uh, this Energy Forum is a, um, a forum organized by three universities, and I recognize the, the deans of the other two universities in the audience, uh, and uh, they are from uh, the Price School um, of Public Policy at the University of Southern California, and the Tsinghua University in Beijing, China. The title of the minister's speech is The EU in a Rapidly Changing World, Where do, where do We Go From Here? And Minister Wallström will address current European challenges ranging from the financial crisis to migration and, of course, Brexit. And in response, she will propose that we build on two concepts, again, two very interesting concepts, complex concepts, one being modernity and the other one being equality. So we all look forward very much to the minister's speech. But before we start and give the word to her, I have the honor of introducing you. The Minister Wallström has been Minister for Foreign Affairs since October 2014. And prior to that, she was a special representative of the United Nations Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict. From 2004 to 2009, she was the first vice president of the European Commission, responsible for institutional relations and communication strategy. Prior to that, for five years, she served as the European Commissioner for the Environment, as I just hinted at. She is chair or member of the board of uh, various international organizations, such as the Council of uh, Women World Leaders, the Global Challenges Foundations, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, and she also is on the board of Lund University in Sweden. Minister Wallström, we're delighted to have you here today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dear friends, thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to meet with uh, young people, and actually I always ask um, for these visits, official visits to different countries and places. I ask to meet with, with students or with young people or with civil society organizations, because that will often give me a very different perspective uh, from that of meeting with the uh, uh, government representatives or other officials. And uh, it complements uh, what I hear also from those in, in power. So um, thank you very much for coming to meet with me. Um, and 
We meet at a time, for sure, marked by the destruction of war and by the desperation of refugees. You know it very well in Germany uh, as well as we do in Sweden. A gardener in Aleppo asks for peace but is silenced by bombs. A Yazidi woman wants to study but Daesh makes her a sex slave. A family dreams about Canada but the boy is washed up on a Turkish beach. We meet at a time also marked by the return of geopolitical rivalries and aggressive nationalism. The very foundations of how we live together are being challenged. Russia tries to move borders through aggression and challenges the European security order. Another nuclear bomb test is conducted by North Korea. Our political landscape is revisited by the specters of xenophobia, autocrats, demagogues, fear-mongering, and some flat-out lies. And uh, to quote uh, Jeanette Winterson in her last book, uh, wrote that if we would read all the signs of our time, we would probably die from a broken heart. But we live on. So we'd better live on and also use our time here on Earth in the best possible way. To paraphrase a man who might soon become maybe the first gentleman of the United States, he said that there is nothing wrong in our world that cannot be cured with what is right in our world. And also dear European and other um, future leaders, there is nothing wrong with Europe that cannot be cured with what is right in Europe. We are right when elections are fair, voices are free, and courts are faultless. We are right when openness, diversity, and trade uh, create decent jobs and equality. We are right when we unite around the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We are right when we in Paris agree to save the planet. We are right whenever peace and diplomacy trump violence. I, I hesitate to use the word trump, but I hear it was. Um, and we are right to believe that when we work together, the very basis of our European project, there are also better days ahead. In times of challenges and opportunities, it is always a pleasure to visit friends. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be here in Berlin, one of Europe's most vibrant places and cities uh, in the context of the Swedish um, state visit. I can reveal a secret to you. I must say the most, one of the most challenging things in uh, coming with the, the king and queen to such a visit, um, the, the most problematic thing is to find to wear hats. I need to wear, we all need to wear hats in the, in the delegation. And most of us never wear a hat on an everyday basis. And also at least two long dre evening dresses. And I think that is what takes most of the time. But it has been, <laughs> joking aside, uh, uh, it has been a, an extremely warm welcome to the king and queen, an enormous interest in them visiting. I don't believe they're interested in me. They, are, they want to see the queen. Uh, uh, and the king, and it has been a, a fantastic visit, visit so far. And Germany is not only uh, Sweden's largest trading partner, but also a very important political ally. And since we are in Berlin, I think it is pertinent to recall the late Willy Brandt, because as you know, he spent uh, parts of his life in Norway and Sweden and spoke uh, um, Norwegian. Um, and to address today's topic, the EU in a rapidly changing world, some of the lessons of Willy Brandt's life taught us uh, that they are more relevant than ever. Our destinies are common. Your destiny is also ours. When in need, we need to help each other, and Europe is stronger when we are united. And our world is for sure stronger if we bridge the gap between our peoples. 
I would like to describe three major challenges that have shaken Europe in the past decade and then conclude with what I see as key reforms and initiatives. First of all, the financial crisis and the recent turmoil, economic turmoil of, of recent years have had a profound impact on our societies and they have increased inequalities and gaps between different groups uh, within our union and they have for sure strained the social fabric of, of Europe in a very uh, clear uh, way. They have also damaged public trust and confidence in the European Union and its institutions. In some countries hit by austerity measures, there is a feeling of having been treated unfairly. In other countries, there is a discontent and perceived obligation to pay for other people's problems. However, we must remember that our economies are intertwined through the single market. And the crisis put the European Union's um, problem-solving capacity to a test. And in the end, uh, we managed to find common solutions. But the aftermath of the financial crisis also had a major impact on the European labor market. And if you're in doubt, talk to young people in Europe. Unemployment levels are still too high in many member states, and this risks sparking social tensions. There is a clear sign that we must continue our reforms, investments, and structural measures. Uh, there seem to be good results of current actions at the EU level, and young uh, youth unemployment levels are actually falling in most member states right now, but this trend needs to be strengthened further. And a bright future for the European Union is linked to the uh, future of young people and their prospects of being offered decent jobs and opportunities to shape their own lives. Secondly, so that was the first crisis and the first real, real challenge. I'm glad they don't believe that I have something stronger. I don't know. Uh, the second challenge, challenge is the refugee crisis the largest movement of uh, people since the Second World War. People are fleeing from war and oppression and misery with the hope of finding protection and a decent life, uh, for example, in Europe. And we have a joint responsibility to take care of those in need and to protect their right to asylum. It is a moral obligation and it is the right thing to do. And may I add, history has shown that migration uh, normally turns out to be uh, a great opportunity for the country that receives ambitious and hardworking citizens. However, the refugee crisis has also created new tensions in the European Union. Sweden, together with Germany, has welcomed a significant number of refugees. Just for your knowledge, um, during last year, we received 163,000 uh, refugees uh, to Sweden. 30% uh, of all the unaccompanied children that came to Europe came to Sweden. And this was also what, in the end, made it necessary to impose uh, restrictions on the way we, uh, we received uh, refugees. But for the asylum, the European asylum system to be sustainable in the long term, all member states must shoulder their responsibility. And this was what both Germany and Sweden believed would happen. But we ended up in a situation where at some point <clears throat> there were a few member states buying all the blankets and other member states buying all the barbed wire in Europe. And this is unsustainable. The third European challenge that I see um, and I would like to address is, of course, Brexit. The Brexit debate is just like the refugee crisis uh, affecting the internal dynamics of uh, the Union. And I deeply regret the uh, result of the referendum. It is certainly not what Sweden and Europe had hoped for. <coughs> Nonetheless, it is important to also respect uh, the will of the British people. 
And now it is important that the EU27 stand united and strive to work in a spirit of solidarity, unity and trust. And we also hope for close UK-EU cooperation in the future, not least on foreign and security policy. The British referendum also put a spotlight on the important question of popular support for the European Union. And it reveals a significant paradox. On the one hand, EU citizens find it difficult to love the European Union. And I once was a co-author of a book with that title. Voters question its democratic legitimacy and tend to take for granted the many advantages that the European integration has granted us. On the other hand, when I travel to different parts of the world, uh, I notice with pride that the European Union uh, is viewed as a shining model of regional cooperation and integration with a strong power of attraction and admired for also how we defend human rights and democracy and all of those things. And the European Union and its member states account for nearly one third of world trade and are collectively also the world's largest aid donor. Personally, I believe that the EU, just as many times before, will come back stronger after yet another harsh uh, wake-up call. Maybe it will, to those of you who are interested in, in uh, political science, it will also lead to debate about uh, the use of referendas because I, I think that there is also a lesson to learn both from this referendum, uh, but also uh, the referendum now held in Colombia. The one ray of hope, a ray of light that we saw in this very dark uh, world we live in, in Colombia, and then the peace deal and peace agreement was turned down by a, a narrow majority in a referendum in Colombia. And I think one has to think very carefully about what it takes to arrange a referendum. Um, and that also there are, it ought to be the most wonderful, ultimate um, political tool that we have, and democratic tool that we have. But it can also be very detrimental to holding a country together. It can create uh, <clears throat> differences and to take sides uh, that will linger on and, and live on in a country for generations. We still remember in our country when we had to vote about using nuclear power. Uh, it was in the 80s. Well, some of us that are as old as me, at least. Uh, I'm confident that in uh, the long run, more countries to our east and, to the, and in the Western Balkans and beyond will join our chosen European path, because it is a path where bloodshed on the battlefield is replaced with patience at the negotiating table. European history has taught us that this is the path we have to follow. And remember that it should always be up to the people themselves, for example, in the Eastern partnership countries, to decide whether they like, would like to join us uh, on, on our path. So let me then highlight a few areas in which we need, where I believe we need concerted action and common solutions. First of all, we need to discuss how to build security in the 21st century. And security is, by definition, something that we must build together. Uh, security is something we share. Uh, that leads us to emphasize de-escalation and disarmament, mediation and dialogue, conflict prevention, and peace building. And um, we, uh, as Sweden is joining the Security Council for next year, we learned that this is covered very well in Article 6 in the UN Charter. Um, and we think that more emphasis should be put on that, using all the democratic and, and institutional and political tools uh, that, that exist to prevent war and conflict. And this is also a cornerstone of <clears throat> Swedish security policy, 
But of course, in recent years, the uh, security situation in our immediate neighborhood has unfortunately deteriorated rapidly. Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and its aggression against Ukraine has cost nearly 10,000 lives already and continues as we speak. And the situation also in uh, the EU's southern border, the attempted coup in Turkey and the ongoing war in Syria also require joint action. And that is why the uh, European Union's dialogue with Russia must be clear and principled and our support to Ukraine strong to help the Ukraine succeed. The EU support to the countries of the Eastern Partnership is key to their development into resilient and democratic societies. So in order to build common security and successfully meet today's multiple challenges, we need to strengthen the European tools at our disposal. A natural starting point for such a discussion is how we use the European External Action Service. European foreign ministers, including myself, have homework to do. So we very much welcome uh, the new EU global strategy. That has a strong commitment to values and a rules-based global order, as well as uh, a broad-based approach using all uh, instruments available in external policies. It's a central platform for the European Union to respond proactively and take global responsibility. We need to strengthen uh, also civilian crisis management uh, uh, operations. Uh, and we need to use all our tools, military and civilian instruments, whether within the competence of the member states uh, or the commission, and we need to work more effectively together. And we also need to be able to respond to crisis more rapidly. The concept of EU battle groups needs to be further developed so that they can become the rapid and flexible response force that they were designed to be, but as you know, they have never been used so far. Um, so we have been standing ready, but they have, we have not been able to actually deploy them. Using rapid, flexible, and adequate civilian and military resources where and when they are needed uh, to support long-term stabilization in the full conflict cycle should be the norm. And when we say civilian, we mean, for example, police uh, um, tasks. We, we need to do more to support institution building. We need to train um, civilian uh, personnel in countries where this is, is needed, make sure that the institutions work well in a crisis situation. So we will actively work to move uh, uh, the European Union in this direction. Sweden has a long track record and will continue to be actively engaged in crisis management, the prevention of radicalization, respect for human rights, and also uh, women's role in peace and development. We believe that such a comprehensive and long-term approach is crucial. Political instability, climate change, conflicts and violence affect all of us in one way or the other, directly or indirectly, and it is in our, in, in our interest to tackle these challenges at their root uh, in a coherent and integrated manner. Uh, as Federica Mogherini, the High Representative, puts it in her foreword to the uh, global strategy, in challenging times, a strong union is one that thinks strategically, shares a vision, and acts together. My second point is about migration policy, which um, also is a, a, an a important aspect of the European Union's external relations. The EU must continue to promote peace, security, and development while upholding human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Also, since migration is a global issue, uh, the EU must show strong leadership in following up to the UN summit that just happened a couple of weeks ago uh, on refugees and migra migrants. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we met in New York to, to discuss these uh, issues. In the European Union, we need an efficient common asylum system based on human rights and international law where the reception of asylum seekers is shared uh, collectively. And we need to offer safe legal routes to Europe and make dangerous Mediterranean crossings uh, unnecessary. A number of key decisions have already been made, and they must now be implemented by all. 
In the short term, we are looking at functioning hotspots for the registration of asylum seekers, full implementation of the agreement between the EU and Turkey, and enhanced cooperation with third countries of both origin and uh, transit. And the distribution of asylum seekers, as I mentioned already, is very uneven. And we need to find us a common system where member states share the responsibility to uh, receive people with protection needs. It's a matter of credibility for the European Union. Thirdly, we need a renewed focus on how the EU can better deliver of the expectations of, of our citizens. The support and trust of Europe's citizens uh, are essential to build what we appropriately call a people's Europe. And politicians have um, an important task here in terms of dialogue and communication. We need to explain and seek support for EU policies in the early stages. We need to stand up for joint EU decisions and their implementation phase. So People's Europe is also defending our democracy, standing up to threats, hatred, xenophobia, sexism, and violence against minorities, never accepting demonization of religious or ethnic groups, defending free and independent media, and every person's right to meet and move freely in society. And these democratic values are the foundation of our union. My fourth point is about what we often call a social Europe. We need a Europe that works harder for the well-being of, of its people. In a social Europe, growth and social progress goes hand in hand. Workers in the EU should not be forced to compete against each other on the basis of lower wages or poorer working conditions. A social Europe strengthens people through more secure jobs and better living conditions. And as part of this work, we also must develop a strategic approach, approach to promote gender equality and women's participation in the labor market. We just had the uh, representative or director from the World Bank visiting for a workshop in Stockholm. And he explained to us that they had looked at 173 countries, um, um, of course, gl globally. and. Uh, um, he said that um, actually there were so many examples of uh, laws that uh, discriminate against women and women's participation in economic activities and economic life. So again, taking the example of Russia, which was to the extreme in one direction, 456 jobs are, were identified on a list that women cannot have, jobs that women cannot uh, take. Uh, that included driving uh, metro trains. Uh, I don't know why uh, women would not be able to do that. But also in a country like France, I, d I didn't, I don't know what were if there are examples from Germany. But in France, uh, there are also restrictions to what jobs women can have. For example, jobs where a woman will have to carry something that weighs more than 25 kilos. So a five-year-old, for example. Uh, uh, so you, uh, you, you would think that, uh, uh, have they asked women if this is necessary? It's sort of under the pretext of um, uh, protecting women. But uh, women are very often not asked. And of course, this hinders women from actually taking on uh, those jobs, but also doing uh, uh, economic, doing business or taking on economic uh, development. And um, he meant that this, clearly this will be such an obstacle to economic growth in those countries. So uh, this is just an example of, of what it means. Um, so if, if women's and men's labor force participation rates in the EU were the same, uh, GDP would increase by 12% by 2030. Striving for a truly equal world of work is not uh, only ethically right, it is also economically smart. Here, education and lifelong learning are key. By investing in people and equipping them with the right skills, we can help them to adapt to changing conditions. Uh, in the second half of next year, our Prime Minister will host a social summit in Sweden, which would be, I think, an important milestone to drive these issues forward. My last point is about a green Europe. 
with an ambitious climate, energy, and environmental policy. Maybe it should have been the first point. Uh, they don't come in that order. But I naturally welcome the Council conclusions last week calling for rapid ratification of the Paris Agreement by, economic, by European countries. Uh, but a strong energy union is also needed to um, ensure reduced carbon dioxide emissions and increased renewable energy and energy efficiency. And this is important not only for an efficient energy market and security of supply, but also for competitiveness, sustainable growth, and more jobs in Europe. So finally, uh, uh, dear friends, um, I said uh, at the outset that we, we meet at a time marked by uh, the destruction of war and by the desperation of refugees. And I think there is no other way to end a speech in uh, October 2016 than to return to the war in Syria. And uh, uh, let me be clear, it is totally and utterly unacceptable to bomb civilians, children, and hospitals, and uh, convoys with humanitarian assistance. Assad and Russia are moving further away from peace and humanity. In light of the horrific situation in Aleppo and the breakdown of American attempts to have Russia recommit to the cessation of hostilities, the EU High Representative Mogherini and Commissioner Stylianides launched a humanitarian initiative last Saturday. And that initiative addresses the growing needs of civilians trapped by the conflict, but it also aims to facilitate the urgent delivery of basic life-saving uh, assistance to um, civilians. The objective is also to ensure that <clears throat> medical evacuation of the sick and wounded from eastern Aleppo who are in, in needed, um, urgent need of, of medical care. The focus is on women, children, and the elderly. The EU remains a top donor to the humanitarian response to the Syria crisis, both inside Syria and uh, to the neighboring countries. Uh, we also actively support the attempts to reach a political solution, both through stuff on the Mistura's UN mediation role and by helping the opposition to remain united and committed to a negotiated solution, because the solution is not a military one. The solution must be a political one. Like all of you, um, I see the images uh, coming from, from Syria with a, a broken and angry heart. And let me assure you that both Sweden and the European Union will continue to do uh, what we can to put an end to the slaughter. Because it's, as also Willy Brandt said, peace is not everything. But without peace, everything is nothing. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you for listening. First of all, thank you for the great talk. My name's Emma. I'm an MPP student at Herti. Uh, you touched on some key domestic issues that are influenced in sort of the larger foreign issues facing Europe at the moment, specifically youth unemployment. Uh, I wanted to ask sort of from the other side, how does a, an aging population that's living much longer and really relying on many of the resources that uh, these nations have, and in some cases draining them, how do you address that issue in the context of also needing to cooperate amongst Europe for these sort of big foreign crises that we're facing? facing right now as you know, the domestic populations age and, and drain those resources? Well, we really, that's why we really need the young people to support the aging, an aging population. And uh, you also have to plan much more carefully for an aging population. You need to plan urban you know, cities and, and all of that has to be, it has to be take, it, take into account the fact that, that people live much, much longer and may, might be sort of impaired in one way or the other when it comes to moving around. But um, I also think that people will probably work uh, longer because they are healthier and they uh, feel that they can contribute. Um, it's not um, that much of a, 
um, sort of coordination on on those policies. But I think the discussion is, of course, ongoing, and there are there are programs, but not that many uh, proper directives on what member states should uh, should be doing. Uh, but I think it will be increasingly on the political agenda how to to deal with those uh, with those challenges. I think that's the best answer without knowing exactly what the directives. It's really for other ministers than than uh, the portfolio that I have. So so I, I wouldn't know exactly what is uh, ongoing right now. But a very important uh, discussion, for sure. Thank you very much for the speech. My question is related to long-term strategy in conflicts. So uh, Sweden is a close ally to Germany anyway. When I think of northern Afghanistan, for example, Africa, Balkans, why do you think it's so difficult, or let's say it's so easy to reach a military end state in a quite short term in conflict? And then it's so difficult to reach a political end state. And it seems that uh, it is very hard to find the right way to solve conflicts in the long term. Do you think uh, in Europe we are well advised maybe to be less offensive promoting democracy in countries where democracy has never been? So maybe we should step back a little bit in Europe and not so much promote our own system and let the people outside Europe live the way they want, maybe without democracy. Sorry. You have put a million do dollar question. I think this is the, it's the most relevant and the most difficult question to answer to. Uh, how do you, because how do you deal with the, um, the remnants of, uh, of the Arab Spring, where actually today the only country where we can see progress is uh, Tunisia. And we are happy we will actually open an embassy, reopen an embassy in Tunisia and where they have done things right. And uh, at the same time, uh, what else can we promote rather than, than the universal ideas of human rights and, and democracy and respect for, for rule of law and, and all of those things? What else can we do but to support um, the building of, of a state that rests also on that kind of, of foundation? Um, but but you're also right that sometimes we are very insensitive, and maybe the resources that we spend on these sort of civil uh, efforts are so much less than what we are willing to pay militarily. So first you bomb, I mean, look at Syria again. So we will bomb it to, to rubble, but we have already started to think about a reconstruction plan for Syria. And this is one of the things we discussed with, with uh, my, my colleague Steinmeier as well. And uh, Germany has been involved before in those efforts the day after, called the day after. What happens the day after or when, when peace comes in terms of laying down weapons? So what do we do then? And how do we keep that sort of vision alive? So that, and how do you, how do you actually ask the Syrian people Shouldn't they be the ones to dis determine the future of their own country? Now everybody else is there using it as a battleground. And that's a very, very serious and, and wrong, it's a wrong situation. But there is no simple answer to your question. But we have said that, for example, looking at how the Security Council works, maybe more efforts to have reporting on situations that could escalate. And how can we then use everything from the good offices of the, of the Secretary General to mediation or, or negotiation teams or maybe a team of, of wise men and women to travel to a, an area where we know it's a, a bit of social unrest to see if they can help at a much earlier stage. Um, and we know several of these situations. So I, I think it's a, a perfect question, a perfect question, but no, I don't know if anybody has a, sort of one right answer to it. And uh, you feel very sad also for the, the Arab Spring because there was so much hope attached to uh, the, uh, the uprising of, of people in all these countries in the Arab world and so little that actually brought all the benefits of, of, uh, of that uh, social uh, uprising to to people, and instead there was uh, conflicts and wars and and chaos in in many of the countries. 
I thought somebody would ask about the feminist foreign policy. Uh, uh, I'm Sophia, I'm also an MPP student, and that was also my question, since you talked about feminist foreign policy and jobs women can do, if you could speak about the UN Secretary General election. Mm. I've been saying today that um, <clears throat> um, I have this quote from, from uh, Gandhi. We thought it was Gandhi, anyhow. He said that uh, uh, first they um, ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And I think this is what we will do with the feminist foreign policy. Maybe there were some giggles, but the, it has stopped. And there is definitely an interest in looking at uh, how you can define and uh, carry on with the smart policy that includes also a role for women. And we've seen it in Colombia, where we have supported women to give them a voice, where we have helped uh, women in Syria. We are the ones who have trained, paid for women to go to Geneva to uh, actually sit at the negotiating table. And without half of the population, how can you get peace? We know that those peace deals where women have been in involved have brought more options on the table from the very beginning, and they are lasting longer. So why would you uh, not uh, choose an option that gives you a, a, a more sustainable peace? And we look at it from the three R's. We say it's about rights, it's about representation, and about resources. And this is also what all our uh, embassies are doing right now, looking at the reality uh, from uh, these lenses on, from with these glasses on, from a, a women's and girls' perspective. And uh, that will help. It will help peace, economic development. Uh, and we are trying also to do projects like um, training women mediators and negotiators to never again hear the argument, there are no women uh, negotiators. Yes, there are. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and particularly for ending on such a high note. That was uh, really very nice to hear. And uh, we're very grateful uh, that you took time out of a very busy day here in Berlin, and we hope to see you again at the Hertie School. I'd like to thank all of you for coming here this afternoon, and uh, especially the Hertie students for asking good questions. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.